Well, good morning, everyone. It is so good to be with you today for worship. And, uh, you know, normally, well, always I'm dealing with allergies. But today with baptism and sending these seniors out into the world and some of the lyrics that we're singing, I find myself choked up and fighting this knot in my throat. And so I'll just blame it on allergies. Ooh, the weather. Um, It is good to be with all of you who are with us online right now, worshiping from many different locations. Last week, we had a wonderful Easter celebration together as a church family, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, I was reminded this week, and perhaps you've heard this story as well, but it, it, it has to do with the resurrection. There was a man who had gone to the Holy Land on somewhat of a spiritual pilgrimage, and he had taken his wife, and then he decided to also take his mother-in-law, and they were going to experience the Holy Land together. They made many good memories the first few days that they were there, and then tragically, uh, his mother-in-law passed away in her sleep one evening. And so uh, while they were making arrangements to bring his mother-in-law's body home for uh, a burial and a a celebration of life, he was visited by a priest there in the Holy Land who said, you know, there is this ministry that would bury her here, and it's only $150. Now, you're going to spend about $5,000 to ship her body home. Why would you not just spend the $150 and have her buried in the Holy Land? By the way, that'd be a great story right? And the the man said, well, thanks for the offer, but I have heard about a man that was buried here at one point, and he came back from the dead three days later, and I don't want to take that (laughs) chance. It's good. Somebody said amen. Oh, man. Um, Next service, our youngest, Macy, is being baptized, and my mother-in-law is here from Denver, and I might omit that joke. (laughs) Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. This is the Sunday morning following Easter, or as I've heard, post-Easter. Post-Easter. It's possible that many people celebrated Easter a week ago and haven't thought about it since. And that's understandable because we have somewhat turned Easter into a holiday or an event on our calendar or a brunch. But the Bible makes a very different argument because Jesus said, I am the resurrection, which tells me that the resurrection is not something on the calendar. The resurrection is not an event The resurrection is not a brunch. It's not the massive ham lunch that my family had last week. But the resurrection is a person. The resurrection is Jesus Christ. And so I just want to start this post-Easter season with you by declaring that there is no such thing as post-Easter. Don't say it. There's no such thing. As post-Easter, we are still lingering in the outcomes of Holy Week. As Easter people, these historical events demand our attention today and every day, not just one Sunday, because Easter never ends. That being said, we are in this 50-day period known as Easter Tide, the 50 days from Easter to Pentecost. And this series that we are in, we looked at the resurrection last week, this morning, we're going to look at the ascension of Christ into heaven. Next week, the sermon is going to be all about Pentecost, and then we're looking at two very pivotal moments in church history that we read about in the book of Acts. So as we focus on these pivotal moments in the Christian faith and in the history of the church, I want to challenge you to be especially intentional about a few things. So you write these down or punch these in your phone. They all begin with an R because, Pastor, isn't that what good preachers do? Trying to give you something easy 
to remember today. Number one, rejoice in the resurrection. Yes, we did that last week. Do it every week. Do it every Sunday morning. We rejoice in the resurrection. Every Sunday morning is an Easter celebration. Number two, remember your baptism. Remember the symbolism here of being in the water and emerging out of the water. Christ being in the tomb and emerging out of the tomb. Number three, return to spiritual disciplines. If you have not been praying, if you have not been reading your Bible, if you have not been spending intentional time of fellowship in the body of Christ, okay, start. Return to those spiritual disciplines. Let this Easter tide season be the season in which you draw back in to those disciplines. Number four, reflect on the birth of the church. Remember, what we read about long ago is what we're sitting in today. Because of the events that took place post-resurrection, we're still gathering, we're still an assembly of followers of Christ today. And number five, this message is not meant to be kept just to us, but it's to extend to our neighbors. So reach out to your neighbor. Christ did not just die for you, but he died to whoever lives to your left and lives to your right. And if they don't know him as Christ, as Savior, well, guess what? That's your assignment. Have them over for dinner. Focusing on these five things will help us resist this post-Easter mindset where we lose our spiritual fervor. And focusing on these five things will make Easter more than just a day on our calendar, but a part of every day of our lives. So before we look at Scripture today, I want us to just think about Christ's disciples, and I want us to think about the emotional uh, instability that Jesus' disciples must have felt. Because when Jesus died, every single one of them felt their dreams defeated. As if, wow, we must have bet on the wrong, the wrong Messiah. Right? As one of my colleagues, Diego, says every day, party's over. Their hope had been crumbled into ashes, and they would have likely been very anxious. Why? Their leader had just been killed as a threat to Caesar and the Roman Empire. So they were huddled together, not in faith, but in fear, figuring that they were lucky to escape with their own lives. A few years ago, the Wall Street Journal had an article titled, The Easter Effect. And the author wrote that the disciples, a group of first century nobodies, must have been baffled, skeptical, and even frightful about what had happened to their former teacher and what could have happened to them. If they were thinking at all about their future, this is probably all they were thinking. Let's just return to our fishing boats and keep an extremely low profile. But then the disciples hear rumors that Jesus is alive likely increasing their emotional instability, right? What's going on here? Suddenly, verse 36, while they were still talking about this, this is the rumor of the resurrection, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Hmm. Peace be with you was a normal Jewish greeting at the time, but maybe not after all of the trauma that Jesus had experienced. Even still, they're frightened just like you and I would be frightened. In many cultures, it is popular to believe that dead people can reappear in spirit form 
But Jewish theology did not support this belief and discouraged all attempts to contact the dead. So as they're frightened, how does Jesus calm them down? He says, look at me. Touch me. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. The marks of the crucifixion would have been unmistakable. Look at the intimacy in that moment. Don't be afraid. Come, touch me. It's, it's me. And while the resurrected Christ would have been more than enough to comprehend in that moment, I personally think the weirdest moment is then watching a previously dead man eat a fish. I love this quote by theologian Rudolf Bultmann. Typical encounters with the recently deceased do not issue in claims about an empty tomb, nor do they lead to the founding of a new religion. And they certainly do not typically eat and drink. And they're not seen by crowds of up to 500 people. And listen to this theologian. He says, I'm sure of it. From hearing rumors to being terrified to disbelief to shock and fear and astonishment and joy, the disciples would soon realize that they were reunited with the real Jesus, who is unquestionably the Messiah. For those 40 days, Scripture describes Jesus appearing to a variety of people in many different settings. In 1 Corinthians 15, we read one of those is before 500 people and not some Casper the Ghost kind of Jesus, but real flesh, skin and bones. The resurrected Jesus walked in familiar places. He preached, he performed miracles, and he offered instructions in Luke 24. We're told that hearts burned. Have you ever opened your Bible and felt a burning sensation on the inside? Hearts burned as Jesus explained the scriptures with heightened clarity, offering this crash course on post-resurrection theology. The Gospel of John's final verse, chapter 21, verse 25, tells us and expresses the magnitude of Jesus' life. Jesus did many other things as well, not just what you read, not just what is documented in Scripture. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. One author says that John is conveying here his enthusiastic sense of the inexhaustible fullness of the human life of Jesus. How can we wrap our minds around who he is? Jesus' birth was designed from the beginning. His miracles showed his power, his preaching taught wisdom, his persecution and death fulfilled prophecies, his resurrection astonishing but rarely talked about, rarely looked at in Bible study, rarely celebrated around the dining table, is the ascension of Christ into heaven. Raise your hand high today if you have ever gone to your mailbox and opened an Ascension Day card. I'm serious. I really want to know. Exactly. Look with me at Luke 24, 50 to 53. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. If you want to be honest with me and I'm honest with you, Jesus rising up into the clouds feels a little bit like a scene from Monty Python. It's a little strange. The ascension is difficult to understand. It's bizarre to grasp. It's even harder to apply. As a result of highlighting this climactic historical event, my hope is that the ascension of Christ into heaven will never be an afterthought to Good Friday or Easter Sunday. As a side note, if you want to get your calendar out, 
If you want to celebrate the Ascension, the 40th day of Easter, which includes Resurrection Day, that is Thursday, May 26th. Just like Jesus explained the scriptures to the disciples and their eyes were opened and their hearts burned, I pray that we also, through the help of the Holy Spirit, can understand and feel the significance of the ascension. So, Lord, we just pray if there's any veils over our minds today concealing the splendor of your work, remove it so we can comprehend this. Here are four life-changing results of the ascension of Christ into heaven. And by the way, when I introduce that and say four life-changing results, I'm talking about your life and yours and yours and yours and yours. So don't look across the row and think, those are life-changing for her. These are life-changing for all of us. Number one, the ascension is Jesus' enthronement as king. You know, we see him ascending into a cloud, Acts 1, 9 through 11. And later in chapter 7, we see Stephen calling out and seeing him standing at the right hand of God, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel 7, 13 through 14, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. Everybody awake? He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Do you want to know what this means when we read that his kingdom cannot be destroyed and will not pass away? Do you know what that means? It means his kingdom will not be destroyed and it will not pass away. I just told you we celebrate Easter every week. Come on, wake up. Christ sits on his throne as king, and he will return to consummate his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, remember this today, our king, yes, we just celebrated that he's risen, but reigning and returning as well. Our king is risen, He's also reigning. He's king. He's on his throne, and he is going to return. Number two, go ahead. Yes. A little bit of enthusiasm. Come on, wear it off on me. Number two, the ascension makes Christ supreme over our enemies. Jesus will reign until all enemies are subdued under his feet. Psalm 110, 1, Acts 2, 34 and 35, Hebrews 1, 13. Christ is in heaven with angels, authorities, and powers subjected to him, 1 Peter 3, 22. And remember what Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power, catch this, it's the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ. There's the resurrection. Raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And God placed all things, say all things, all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. Ephesians 1, 18 through 23. So, let me speak briefly to any of you who feel desperate today. You're worn out. 
And you're in a really tough battle. Maybe you're tired of everybody around you, even your friends, your family. Telling you, what's the matter? Come on. Christ is resurrected. Move on. Be happy. You can do it. I want to speak to all of you who are in the middle of some sort of struggle or battle, and I want to give you relief in this. Small phrase in that passage I just read. God placed all things under Christ's feet. And that includes the one that is attacking you. That includes the one that is accusing you. Satan is under his feet. And I'm just going to ask you to keep hope. Because you may be in a battle right now, but the war, it's already won. So we wait. We wait. We can sing with confidence the lyrics that we sang a few moments ago. When I fight, I fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Number three, the ascension paves our way to the Father. You know, there's got to be no sweeter reunion in all of time than Jesus' return to the Father. And because of that reunion, we too can experience our own journey one day to be in the presence of the Lord. Remember this astonishing and reassuring promise of Jesus. This promise is for you. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. There's a reason right there that Christ ascended to the Father. Why? Father's house has been built. Christ went home. And his homecoming to the Father prepares the way for our homecoming to the Father as well. St. Augustine once wrote, cleave, cleave unto Christ, who by descending and ascending has made himself the way. Do you wish to ascend? Hold fast to him that ascends. For by your own self you cannot rise. Be then a member of him who has ascended. Number four. The ascension released the Holy Spirit into the world. The ascended Lord sent the Spirit of God to be present to transform Christ's followers, to deposit the fruit of the Spirit into our lives, and to empower us to live on mission. God promised through the prophets long ago, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and this promise was fulfilled only 10 days after the ascension of Christ into heaven, and that is next week's sermon by a wonderful friend and guest preacher. I cannot wait, and I hope you'll be here. Let's stand to our feet and respond to God's word by exalting the risen King.